On May 25, 2020, during the height of the pandemic in America, Derek Chauvin, a Minnesota police officer, kneeled on George Floyd's neck for nearly 10 minutes during an arrest, eventually resulting in Floyd's death. What do you want? I can't breathe. Please, the knee in my neck. I can't breathe shit. In the aftermath, Black Lives Matter protests, while mostly nonviolent, still had outbreaks of rioting and looting from May 26th to June 8th. In terms of total property damage and theft, the George Floyd protests had surpassed the previous largest civil disobedience event in American history, the LA riots. As the protests unfolded and media attention started to focus on the incidents of rioting and looting, a debate started to unfold. Libertarians and counter-BLM protesters invoked the idea of the Second Amendment, that one should have the right to defend their property with firearms. Radical liberals and BLM protesters countered that people's lives were more important than property, and that these businesses should have had insurance to cover any sort of property damage. Libertarians and right-wingers brought up roof Koreans, in reference to the Korean men who defended Koreatown during the LA riots in 1992 with firearms. They claimed that during the riots, these men were able to shoot black looters and rioters without consequences and that they should be able to follow their lead. Radical liberals would remark falsely that these Koreans were anti-black white supremacists who were violent against peaceful protesters during the riots. The problem? Both of these sides are horrifically wrong about the events that took place. Out of all the chaos and deaths of the LA riots, only one person was killed in the Koreatown area, Edward Lee an 18-year-old Korean boy who was shot by friendly fire as he was trying to defend stores. Secondly, the riots were not mostly peaceful protests like the George Floyd protests. It was a focused and targeted assault of Koreatown made possible as a myriad of factors combined to create a perfect storm of events. In all of the lookbacks of the LA riots, we've only heard the mainstream media's interpretation of the events, which included both white and black voices, but for the most part ignored Korean voices. In the black and white paradigm of most racial discussions, Korean Americans have been shoehorned into both positions when convenient. But the reality of the situation is that Koreans do not fit into this binary discourse of race. We, as well as many other Asian Americans, are outside of this racial paradigm completely, and our story is not understood by either the white or black communities. Many of these misconceptions and myths can be cleared up with a simple Wikipedia search. It has been the power of the American media machine that has already convinced you of a certain narrative of the events. As I dug a bit deeper into these interviews, I realized that there is a greater story to tell, as we now have seen the story over and over again in America. The Watts Uprising in 1965, the LA riots of 1992, and now the George Floyd protests in 2020. And every time an event like this happens, the powers that be end up relatively unscathed. How could that be possible? How are we not learning from the mistakes of the past? In my search, I uncovered things about the LA riots that no one really had known. Until now. Understanding the LA riots is understanding how racial groups, particularly black and Asian ones, are pitted against each other by white supremacy. As the George Floyd protests seemed to echo a lot of the discourse from 30 years ago, I wanted to fully understand the story of the Roof Koreans to finally find the truth. Many African Americans arrived in LA during the Second Great Migration during the 1940s, when African Americans started moving to urban areas for industrial jobs. However, most of Los Angeles was designated as whites only in the early 20th century, and these restricted covenants would enclose African Americans in a very small area. As the African-American population grew significantly, their relationship with the LAPD got off to a terrible start. Police brutality similar to the Rodney King assault was an everyday occurrence. On August 11, 1965, after one such incident, the Watts uprising lasted for a week. The reaction was justified, as many African-Americans would directly confront the police that had been antagonizing them for decades. However, small businesses were also looted in the chaos. Most of these businesses at the time were Jewish owned, however, the looting seemed to be more from opportunism rather than anti-Semitism. In the aftermath, the African American community would win concessions from the city and the state of California, most directly in the form of repealing a law that maintained many of these housing restrictions. Jewish businesses would also receive assistance from the local and state governments in the form of reparations. Many Jewish people would sell their businesses to African Americans and leave the area afterwards, which now makes up most of current South Central. The Jewish Americans had a significant financial interest in 
South uh, Central, and they were thriving in their businesses, allegedly without giving back to the community. So there was a lot of growing resentment uh, in the African American community, and the riot really woke them up. I believe there was a lot of um, exodus of the ownership uh, at that time. And matter of fact, I have revisited the area years after, like every decade, 10 years or so, I noticed that the stores like mom and pop groceries and liquors that used to be owned by Korean people for a long time is now owned by Bangladeshi Indians, I noticed. So they sort of replaced Koreans and Koreans moved out of the area. Early Koreans settled in Los Angeles during the 1930s, which was also designated a racial covenant prior to the overturning of Proposition 14 of 1964. The area where they settled is now known as Koreatown. Koreatown sits around 10 to 15 miles north of South Central, almost in a central location of Los Angeles, just a few miles west of downtown. Until the Hart Seller Immigration Act of 1965, immigration to the United States was much more difficult from Asia. After 1965, many new Korean immigrants were attracted to the area as it had recently gone through an economic downturn, lowering the price of housing in the area significantly. While the stereotype is that Koreans came with money and were granted opportunities other minorities were not, the opportunities for newer Korean immigrants were limited, even if they had advanced degrees. By the 1990s, Koreatown itself didn't have tensions with the African American community, as there were very few black people in the area. The area was mostly Korean and Mexican populated, as it remains today. The so called tension between the Korean community and the African American community came from the Korean liquor stores operating in South Central. Korean liquor stores were a point of slight controversy in South Central. During the 1980s, gang violence was at an all time high, peaking by the early 90s. Los Angeles homicides were over three and a half times what they are today. Although the narrative is that Korean immigrants were granted loans and opportunities that African Americans were not, this is simply not true. Well, the K concept is um, you essentially get a group of people, um, typically in the number of 20 or so people, and they all put in uh, equal amounts. And for each month, a person would take that as a loan and it's on a rotation basis. And I think it's the order is determined by the lottery. <laughs> they think it's fair game. And that way, everyone gets a chance to get uh, a bigger um, capital funding, right? Nor was operating a liquor store in South Central particularly lucrative. If you have to spend 18 to 20 hours a, a night, a day, to make your store work, that is not someone who has the luxury to do anything but make the business go. Many of the store owners knew that their life was at risk by operating you know the dry cleaner or the liquor store but they didn't have many options. Empire Liquor, the liquor store owned by the Dew family, was a disastrous place to do business. When the Dews bought the place in 1989 they had no idea what they were in for. You know they were victims of 40 shoplifting incidents a week and that's just like the bare minimum. But on top of that, uh, the fact that she was a victim of robbery 30 times before that, and also being threatened over 20 times that her store would be burned down, that in itself, I think, would cause a lot of trauma and rage. If you fall victim of the shoplifting over and over and over again, and sometimes you catch them, instead of being apologetic, they become violent. They're wanting to fight. I ran grocery store for six years, so I know, in a, in a not very safe area. So, once you go through that experience over and over again, you become calloused and you become more disrespectful. The Dews owned two stores, one in Saugus and another in Compton. On March 16, 1991, Latasha Harlins, a high school student, went to Empire Liquor to buy a bottle of orange juice. Du, who saw Harlins put the bottle of orange juice in her bag, suspected her of intending to steal the orange juice, as she had seen similar behavior from shoplifters in the past. No, she got beat up at the 
glass bottle of orange juice and she was in fear for her life. I don't know how it was modified, but they were saying that it was easier because it usually takes a certain amount of force to pull that trigger. But in this situation, I believe it was modified in such a way that you could shoot easily. But I'm sure she had no, no knowledge about that. Maybe she just wanted to scare her to get her out of the store. And all of a sudden the trigger, who knows? The reaction from the Korean American community was mixed. Some distanced themselves from Du completely, agreeing with mainstream narratives about her. Others sympathized with her as they knew what operating a store in that area was like, saying something like that could have happened to them. However, no one from Koreatown would defend the actual shooting. Court documents would show that no appeal was made to the court for lighter sentencing from the Korean American community. Du was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. However, Judge Joyce Carlin, a white woman, claimed that there were mitigating circumstances, namely that Du was unlikely to commit the same murder again as she had no prior convictions, and that she had been affected by the trauma of operating the liquor store. She was sentenced to five years of community service, 10 years of suspended prison sentence, 400 hours of community service, and a $500 fine. Understandably, the African American community was incensed. However, in the media, the Korean American community knows that there was a juxtaposition of the Rodney King case and the Latasha Harlan's case. <laughs> The after the sentencing was upheld by the California Court of Appeal on April 21st, 1992, Los Angeles waited with bated breath for the Rodney King sentencing to be upheld on April 29th. A couple weeks prior to the tragedy in South Central, on March 3rd, 1991, a black man named Rodney King was pulled over for speeding in the San Fernando Valley. While arresting King, LAPD officers tasered and beat King with batons, claiming in later court documents that he was resisting arrest. However, for the first time in American history, an amateur videographer caught the incident on tape from his apartment window, unbeknownst to the LAPD. The resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, when smartphone video recording became ubiquitous, is not a coincidence. Prior to Rodney King, there was no official video documentation of police brutality, and so police narratives on their arrests were always taken at face value. The story became national headline news as activists in Los Angeles and all over the country rallied around the outrage. In the first two weeks alone, the LA Times published 43 articles, the New York Times published 17 articles, and the Chicago Tribune published 11 articles on the case. Eight stories about the Rodney King incident appeared on ABC News, as well as a 60-minute primetime live segment. The pressure seemed to be mounting for LA officials, but they were thrown a bone in the form of Latasha Harlan's tragedy, just less than two weeks later. From the onset, the media had a clear agenda. Here's how I look at it. I, I feel like the media had a, a, a very big responsibility in turning you know, race versus race. 
you know, like for example, you know, people cite the Sunja Du Latasha Harlan's situation. But every time they showed the Rodney King video, the media always showed the Sunja Du Latasha Harlan's video side by side, like as if they had something to do with each other. And they'd always say the same thing. Korean store owner shoots black girl. The media would also paint Du in an extremely negative light. She doesn't even know how to use it. The first time she has ever touched that gun, she had been victimized so many times. So they were already under pressure. So they had this prejudice against black customers coming in and they were on guard all the time. What are they gonna do? Are they gonna steal? Are they gonna attack me and kill me? So she was just acting in a defensive manner, which was carried out a little too far. While Du certainly committed a terrible crime, the news coverage of her as a cold-hearted murderer was definitively racist, preying on the fact that Koreans had no effective countermeasure against the mainstream narrative. The media effectively gave the black community a scapegoat for police brutality by connecting the liquor stores and extreme crime and gang violence in South Central to the Rodney King case. They gave the impression that the Korean-American community was in cahoots with white supremacy, and some started to believe that Korean-Americans also supported the LAPD. The effect of the media was clear. On October 31st, 1991, Ice Cube released a song called Black Korea, which was essentially a directive, loot and burn down Korean-owned liquor stores. While the anger from the African-American community was understandable, this was clearly racist and anti-Asian, calling for violence and arson against Korean-American stores. Even to this day, as I'm reading the lyrics, it's quite traumatizing. The words that are used to describe the store owners is very degrading. The black community accuses the Koreans of not doing, or Asians not doing, of not respecting black community. But I would have to say this is a great example of the disrespect the other way around that I think, again, many of the store owners also face. By 1992, the media had secured buy-in from the Los Angeles African-American community that Korean-Americans and their stores were a problem to South Central and its community members. Outrage from the African-American community was palpable, as the narrative that Korean store owners were all categorically violent anti-black people started to pick up steam. Du's lawyer, an African-American attorney named Charles Lloyd, was a star criminal defense attorney that once was offered a position of federal judge from President Nixon. He petitioned for a lenient sentence and fully supported Judge Carlin's decision. What I know about the case is that Charlie Lloyd, who was the defense lawyer, African-American, after he defended her and won, was really vilified in his own community. And he had been one of the most prominent black lawyers in L.A. at the time. He told me that he'd come out of the courthouse and get spit on. Uh, he got threats from people. He couldn't practice law anymore because people were so angry with him. And he ended up um, retiring. He retired. Dew's store was firebombed several times in the year after the shooting and would be completely leveled during the riots. In addition, from the years 1991 to 1993, 43 Korean Americans were murdered, mostly in South Central, for retaliatory gang violence. 43 store owners that were killed, yeah. Yeah, something in that vein, but none of it again was ever covered. On April 29th, 1992, at around 3.15 p.m., the Rodney King verdict was read. While there was some sporadic violence that erupted against random citizens, there was also almost immediately a coordinated assault of Korean-owned liquor stores in South Central. Rioters would pass by stores that had a poster that said black owned, as if a tacit understanding had previously been organized in the African American community, while 200 Korean liquor stores were all looted or burned down. People are coming in and robbing Korean stores and taking TVs, taking whatever they want, and then the camera would pan to police officers standing there, smoking cigars. So that was a commercial, it was an advertisement to everybody who was at home going, it's open season, look. The cops are standing there and little Korean ladies are chasing people out of the store and everyone's having fun. They're laughing and they're having a good time. It's a party. Throughout the chaos, Radio Korea became the central point of command as it became clear to the Korean Americans that the LAPD were not going to help them. A task force was quickly organized in Koreatown to coordinate with Radio Korea to essentially act as guards warding off gang members from small businesses. Yeah, this, this is just... 
그래서 우리가 뭐라고 뭔가를 목표를 세워서 방송을 해야 되겠는데 그것은 무엇이냐 이 상황을 빨리 피하고 집에 가십시오라는 내용의 방송을 하자 이렇게 된 거죠 우리의 가장 중요한 건 뭐겠습니까 우리의 생명입니다 그러니까 빨리 가게 문을 닫으시고 집으로 들어가십시오 귀가하십시오 이렇게 된 거죠 그 당시에 한인 상공 회의소장을 하고 있던 하기완이라는 사람이 방송국을 찾아와요 그 사람이 방송국을 찾아와서 책상에다가 군총을 딱 꺼내요 그러면서 이런 식으로 방송하다가 우리 코리아타운은 다 없어지길 바라십니까 지금 밖에 나가 보십시오 이 전쟁입니다 Put into my hand and say, yeah, that's crazy, ridiculous. You should start to defend, to start to protect the business. It's not the right saying then, all the church minister come, then go home, then pray God. That's a crazy, ridiculous idea. Then Lee Jang-hee, president, and Mr. Choi, the current here, they listen to me, then they realize, oh, that may be true. So then he asked me to come to radio, uh, the mic, the, then start here, yeah, saying to my people then, please don't go home, protect your business. 싸우고 그럴 때도 라디오는 한국 라디오를 들, 들고 있었다고. 어떤 일이 상황이 벌어지면 여기서 막 전화도 하고 정보도 주고 만약에 라디오 커리어가 없었다? 그럼 우리 커뮤니케이션에 아무것도 없는 거야. 어디서 무슨 일이 터지는지 아무도 몰라 그러면. By midnight, black gang members started to make their way north from Compton. Rioters were recorded as saying that they were going to target white neighborhoods, such as Beverly Hills and Brentwood, but most of the rioting on the second day ended up in Koreatown. The LAPD, purposely held back by their chief, Daryl Gates, set up shop all over the predominantly white and affluent areas of the city, such as Culver City, Beverly Hills, Hancock Park, West Hollywood, Hollywood, and even Little Tokyo and Chinatown, while leaving Koreatown virtually empty. <laughs> 그때는 그걸 잘 몰랐었어 우리 상황이 벌어졌을 때는 근데 나중에 우리가 알았지 그거를 LAPD가 몽땅 글로 갔다는 걸로 그 베어블리 힐스 지켜주고 여기는 불 나고 여기 사람이 죽고 막 그런데 전부 거기가 있었단 말이야 그러니까 그게 올바른 거라고 생각을 해요? 아니잖아 그건, 그건 절대 아니라고 여기를 만약에 처음에 잘 지켜줬으면 그렇게 크게 폭동이 안 났을 거야 아마 코레타운은 그 사람들이 버린 거예요 한마디로 얘기하면 그래서 너무 속상해 그런 게 Gates had already set aside a million dollars in overtime pay for April 29th, indicating that he knew that it was extremely likely that there would be rioting on that day. However, records show that a third of the force was inactive during the riots, and that the LAPD were specifically told not to go into Koreatown. Gates himself would be seen going to Brentwood for a fundraiser, while most of his captains were out of town for a retreat during that weekend. Since the LAPD was not coming, the main line of defense for Koreatown was set up on top of the California market that still stands today. These were the infamous roof Koreans that the media would portray as violent and aggressive, but were in fact defending not just their property, but their community and their lives. They have gathered there to show our position that we have gathered here armed because law enforcement is just totally ignoring our community. Their intention was not there to shoot the looters because you don't kill people for losing property. But rather, it was a gesture to the mainstream that you don't do anything, we'll do something to protect us. On the ground, the youth task force would defend stores outside of the general radius of the protection area, as well as areas not in Koreatown. Tiny Korean Ajima, less than 100 pounds, shaking. She's going to protect her store with a broom. As soon as we walk in with everything, she starts crying because she's so happy to see us. Crying, thanking us for, for being there. We ask her, is anybody here? No, they already took, they already took all my money. And, you know, I'm lucky because they didn't burn the store, but they took everything. So we said, okay, well, we have to go. And I remember vividly this one, Korean Hajima, she was crying, was holding onto my leg. Hajima, just crying, crying, crying. Just, that's how terrified these people were. So it wasn't about if she was black or Latino or white, I would have, you know, done the same thing, come and protected her store. It didn't matter about race. It was about what's right versus what's wrong. And that's something that the media never talks about. As the Korean stores were getting hit, the nearby Mexican population would join and loot the stores as well. It was as if everyone saw the news on the previous night and were emboldened to participate. 
Throughout the chaos, however, not a single black person was killed in Koreatown. Both the task force and the rooftop Koreans had directives only to shoot to ward off would-be looters, as they did not want more trouble. However, Eddie Lee, an 18-year-old Korean boy, was killed by friendly fire when he tried to assist in defending Koreatown. Interestingly enough, the only time the LAPD did anything during the riots was arrest Koreans for doing their job for them. Koreans were rounded up on possession and use of deadly weapons charges, while looters, even with guns themselves, were not. Later that night, Angela Oh, a Korean-American lawyer, was on the nightly news and called out the lack of LAPD in Koreatown. By then, however, the damage was already done. Even with all of that effort, Koreatown barely escaped targeted annihilation. The worst part of the LA riots for the Korean-American community was the immediate aftermath. Close to half of the nearly $1 billion in damage from the LA riots was sustained by Korean-Americans, while 65% of the damage in Koreatown was to Korean stores. It's not, not easy to find the insurance company to insure the small business. Yeah, only building wise, building is protected. 보상을 보험회사에서 보상을 못 받은 사람들이 한 70%가 넘어요. 그러니까 그걸 못 받으니까 사람들이 이제 정부에서 아까 이야기한 SBA 론연 4% 그거를 이제 받을까 그거 갖고 이제 재건했다 그래. 그래서 이제 정부에서는 그래도 보상을 해줬다고 저는 봅니다. 그 당시에 그걸로 인해서 어, 돈을 고맙게 융, 정부에서 지원을 해줬지만은. 원금 이자를 연 4% 해가지고 갚으려니까 의외로 지출이 많아진 거죠. 그게 그거에 힘이 좀 눌려가지고 사람들이 많은 사람들이 이제 그 비즈니스 하는데 어려움을 겪었고 심지어는 이제 크로스한 사람도 있고. Uh, brought a lot of tears because they realized that the insurance that they thought they purchased was good for nothing because they bought insurance from insurance companies that have not been approved by the Department of Insurance in California. And so those insurance companies simply went belly up, and there was no protection from that. The Korean American community held a peace march, declaring that they did not want any trouble with any other community. It was the largest Asian American demonstration, where 30,000 Korean Americans marched in solidarity with Korean American business owners whose lives were destroyed. And they marched in peace with signs that say, you know, we forgive you, let's have peace, you know, no more violence, things like that, and that was my last assignment, was to not walk in the march, but walk on the sidewalks to protect the Koreans that were walking in the parade. Because it was such a weird experience, because all the Koreans that didn't help during the riots, because they were too scared, you know, like the ajumas and the harmonies, they all finally came out during the peace march. And it was risky, because, you know, all the people that were in the parade were Koreans, and all the people that were watching the parade was everybody else. And I remember feeling so sad and, and seeing people crying as they were walking on the street because, you know, some of these Korean people came from Orange County, they came from the Valley, they came from the South Bay, for the first time got to see Koreatown with their own eyes, and they could smell the ash, and they could see the smoke still coming up from all these buildings. And I remember so many people were, were crying during this peace march. And I remember the facial expressions on the side of the road of people who had that Mianan look, like they were sorry to us. I'll never forget that. The community also realized it needed to become a lot more politically engaged as they saw that not having a voice in politics or media had disastrous consequences. The trauma also led to turmoil within the community, as they fought over aid collected from the diaspora, as well as South Korea. Some Koreans distanced themselves from the roof Koreans, trying to fit in with the mainstream narrative by claiming that they weren't like those other violent Koreans. The craziest thing that I didn't expect to happen was I ended up becoming the most angry at Koreans. And the reason why I was most angry at the Korean community was because one of our Tongzings, Eddie Lee, he gave his life to protect Koreatown. And that could have been any one of us. And what happened was the community never thanked us. A bunch of gangpes protected Koreatown. They didn't want to talk about that. They just kind of wanted to just sweep it under the rug. Others would pretend to be heroes and soak up the attention. While we have a riot happening, the shooting happening, never showed up, never in the town. Then they, suddenly they are the one uh, 
as if representing Korea Town. There's many people there. They want to be get credit. So. But the part that stung many Korea Town members the most was the fact that it did not seem that the Los Angeles community felt remorseful at all for the riots. In fact, later on in the media, they would portray Koreans as the instigators of the violence in the riots. Karen Bass, a community organizer at the time, now currently running for LA mayor, would go on to remark that it was actually a good thing that all the stores were destroyed. According to a poll, 40% of Korean store owners considered leaving Los Angeles because of the riots. 2,300 stores were destroyed, and many moved to the neighboring suburbs of Orange County, Riverside, and San Fernando Valley. The Koreatown community was abandoned by every ethnicity in Los Angeles, including its own, as Chinese and Japanese Americans would also distance themselves from narratives created about the alleged innate anti-blackness of Korean Americans. The LA riots were a terrible event in American history, one that was essentially felt entirely by one community, Korean Americans. What was supposed to be a fight against police brutality like the Watts Uprising devolved into a free-for-all targeting of Korean Americans in order to protect the LAPD and the affluent whites of Los Angeles. How did it end up this way? Most Americans recognized the LA riots as a police brutality event, but then how did the LAPD walk away unscathed? Why were there virtually no meaningful policy changes made to address police brutality? How did an ethnicity that makes up less than a few percentage points of the population end up suffering half of the total loss? I've been able to go over some of these examples today, but throughout my many interviews, I've come across so much more to discover, mainly about all the different players involved in city politics and media, who also played a hand in creating this perfect storm of events. Too many pieces aligned in just the right way in order to direct the majority of the violence against the Korean American community. But I hope that this look back encourages you to do your own research of the LA riots, to realize that the mainstream narrative wasn't telling you the whole truth. As a Korean American, it is imperative to understand our history, because if we don't, someone else will write it for us. For me, it was never about race. It was never about politics. It was about right versus wrong. That's what it always was for me. So my message to the young people who, who weren't there is that, hey, you know what? I saw the trap. Admittedly, I fell into the trap of making it race versus race but that's all a trap, you know. Look inside your heart and ask the real questions. If you were there in Taigo protecting businesses and you saw a black store owner protecting her business or his business and you saw people looting it, would you help her? Absolutely. So why wouldn't we? Look at the facts and look inside your heart and see what, what is right and what's wrong. That's my message to the young people that that uh, are falling into these traps.